good evening everybody and thank you very much for coming uh, we normally during the festive season and holiday season in the middle of it we have our uh, foundation day ayuka an unusual time it is hard to bring people away from different festive occasions all over the country and all over the world at this time but it's always great to see uh, whenever we have the foundation day it was the end of the year um to see so many people come here to celebrate um we normally have and this is the 29th foundation day event and we have a uh, our program uh, spread over um two days i'm i'm shoma krachoudhury and uh, welcome you to the beginning of this uh, uh this event so today i mean we switched our uh program this year normally our program has several parts it has a cultural event um we've had a few weeks of uh, sports events leading up to today um and then we have um um you know a, a dinner for for the residents of the colony and all that stuff happens over two days but normally it ends with the foundation lecture this year we decided to start with the foundation lecture and it is also uh, my privilege to welcome professor parthi pratim mujumdar um to give this foundation day lecture this year um what we have done in the past and this lecture has has had a distinguished history of uh, very distinguished people from all over the world to give this lecture uh, once have hold held once a year and we try to diversify into areas outside our expertise astronomy and astrophysics um to bring um a flavor of uh, various other sciences that are done uh, that's being done all over the country to the community here and it also brings in as i can see today um a lot of people who normally don't come to ayuka to uh, our public lectures to come and uh, interact with our community um and uh, in particular uh, the distinction of uh, the speaker tonight apart from him being one of the most distinguished scientists in the country is the fact that he brings different subjects together in showing how powerful Uh, a method of uh, of bringing disparate areas of science together can be professor mojumdar has worked at the indian statistical institute um for almost all of his professional life uh, he was head of uh, the indian statistical institute uh, in calcutta the head of the anthropology and human genetics unit for a while that you might wonder why such a unit was there in the first place at the indian statistical institute till you realize prashant bahlan abishu actually started the isi was one of the first people who actually started thinking about this subject of how to statistically analyze a population and figure out their characteristics their anthropological characteristics and their origin through statistical means and that tradition continued in isi for a long long time um, um under professor mujumdar till he uh, became the founder director uh, <coughs> of the national institute of biomedical genetics um in uh, uh, kolani outside calcutta um which is of course is one of the leading institutes that analyzes uh this kind of thing population and genetics together and brings in mathematics and statistics together with biology and uh today he's going to talk about one of these fascinating subjects that emerges from all this and we'll talk about several other things uh, professor mujumdar has been uh, of course apart from um being associated with the isi and the um, institute of biomedical genetics has been associated with um ISR kolkata and uh, also the jawaharlal nehru center in bangalore as a visiting professor honorary professor um he also has been of course uh, a fellow of uh, all three academies in fact um he's a member of the council of the indian national science academy which is having its annual meeting this year in pune um and has been a fellow of the third world academy of sciences and is a jawish bush fellow um of course what intrigues a lot of us including me is the title of his talk which uh, comes from one of the poems i was um forced to learn by heart in school by long fellow where uh, the interesting thing is of course he talks about lives of great men all remind us that etc well and that, that their footprints would be in the on the sands of time and today the interesting thing is he's going to tell us 
about the common people like us, not the great men, whose footprints also can be seen on the sands of time. Professor Munindar, we are really eager to hear what you have to say. Well, this is really like a New Year's gift. Thank you, Professor Raj Chaudhary, for uh, calling upon me to give this talk. I'm absolutely thrilled and delighted to see so many people in the audience, including Professor Narlikar, whom all of us have looked up to. Thank you very much for coming. Um, in the next several minutes, I've been given about an hour. I'll try and finish within that time. I'm going to trace uh, our history. Uh, our evolution. Uh, much of it is known to you, but I'll try and put it in a cogent manner and then tell you what uh, genes have brought, the kind of um, inferences that we have derived uh, using uh, genes and why we use uh, genes in order to draw these kinds of inferences. So that's the title of my talk and as uh, Shoma said, uh, our is not great men, it's us, the commoners. I'm going to of course start with Darwin. I'm going to talk about human evolution. So who else could I start with? I'm going to start with Darwin. Actually, I'm going to move over here. I have a colored microphone so I can see the slides myself much better. Um, so in 1859, Charles Darwin published a book that uh, changed the world of biology, biological thinking. Uh, and the title of the book is long, almost like a full sentence. Uh, on the origin of species by means of natural selection or the preservation of favored races in the struggle for that's the entire title of his book which usually is known as the origin of species by Charles Darwin. Uh, in of course he, he propounded the entire uh, theory of natural selection um, but what did he have to say about uh, evolution of humans and this is what he had to say about evolution of humans. Life will be thrown on the origin of man and his history and that's all. There's only one sentence in the entire book uh, on this issue in the, uh, in, the, in the very famous book called The Origin of Species. Um, in 1872 then, in 1871, he published this book called The Descent of Man and Selection in Relation to Sex and there he mentioned or he provided a set of uh, arguments that man descended from the great apes. And uh, his arguments were uh, very interesting and I'm going to share his arguments with you. His arguments were as follows. There is correspondence in bodily structure between man and apes, we agree. The structure of the tissues and the comp composition of blood are similar. He couldn't have figured this out except for the color of the blood. Uh, men and apes have common parasites, which is true, body lies. Uh, process of reproduction is the same in all mammals, yeah. The embryo of man closely resembles the embryos of other animal, other mammals, true. Um, undergoing a corresponding order of development, uh, the ontogeny, man possesses certain rudimentary organs, muscles and other parts. Based on these observations, he, he uh, concluded that man descended from the great apes. Anyway, these are interesting observations, uh, phenomenal observations and we know that we did its descent from great apes. So I'm going to tell you a two, two part story starting from the great apes and uh, there are two parts to my story. Part one begins about 5 million years ago and ends about 130,000 years ago. Something happened 130 years, uh, year, 130,000 years ago. I'm going to take a pause there. That's going to be part one of my story. So that's about 5 million years. I'm going to spend exactly 5 minutes telling you part one of my story. Part two of my story will begin at 130,000 years and continues to the present day. That's the part two of my story. So I'll begin with part one of my story. Um, it began about five million years ago. So what happened five million years ago? A population of African apes split into two distinct species. One that led to the humans, the other that's the gorillas and chimpanzees and then further evolution to bonobos and so on. So one of these lines of descent eventually led to the humans and the gorillas and the chimpanzees, the chimpanzees most likely, um, are our most recent common ancestor and, they, and we uh, were all the same about 5 million years ago. More than 4 million years ago, so I have spent less than a minute, 1 million years have elapsed. 
More than 4 million years ago, one of the species on the evolutionary path to humans began spending most of its time, most of its time on two feet, so we became bipedal. And this bipedality uh, was first observed in the genus Australopithecus and have had about, uh, was about, took place about 4 million years ago. So, Australopithecus afarensis is a very famous species and Australopithecus afarensis was identified, discovered uh, about 3 point and, and dated to about 3.1 million years ago, was uh, um, identified by a very famous, a member of a very famous fa family, the Leakey family. Um, and uh, um, prior to that, there was another individual, Johansson, who actually uh, found the first fossil, which was dated to be 3.18 million years, and that fossil was called Lucy. And for those of you who do not know this, the reason why this fossil is called Lucy is when Johansson was actually digging the uh, fossil bed, he was listening to a Beatles song called Lucy's in the Sky with Diamonds. And that's why he named this as Lucy. Um, so there's nothing more to it. Uh, it had it had a very large skull and it was uh, hominid. Uh, subsequently, uh, the, the, the family that I talked to you about, the Leakey family who spent several generations uh, excavating fossils and finding human or uh, excavating human evolution in Africa. Uh, this was discovered in 1975 by Mary Leakey. This is a volcanic um, uh, rock bed or volcanic ash bed uh, which was found near Kenya and there are footprints on this. Uh, I can't read these footprints but those uh, who are trained to read these footprints will vouch that whoever walked on this uh, rock bed it had it had uh, cooled, the rock bed had cooled, but still it was molten and that is the reason why um, the, the footprints were found. Um, whoever walked on this had a bipedal cage. This rock bed has been dated to be 3.7 million years. So, about uh, between 3 uh, and 4 million years, we became bipedal and Australopithecus afarensis was one of the earliest species. So, this is testimony to uh, an upright cage. What happened because we became upright, something happened, some evolutionary trend began. Uh, a profound ev evolutionary trend began. Our hands became free to use for manipulation. So, we were uh, being predated on, there were preys that were eating us and because we were, uh, we were able to stand upright and our hands became free, so we could throw stones at predators. Not only could we throw stones, we could spot predators from uh, a longer distance. So, our ability to uh, to survive uh, or protect ourselves uh, from being um, eaten up by predators uh, increased and therefore we were able to leave more offspring for the next generation. So visibility over higher underbrush uh, and we know that around that time concomitantly the brain size increased but what we do not know is whether the brain size increase uh, was due to bipedality or was just a concomitant uh, uh, happening or event that took place around then. Um, so, we had dramatically larger brains, but we will never know whether this was due to bipedality. Some people have claimed to be uh, that, that uh, dramatically larger brains was due to uh, bipedality. Uh, again, we come to the origin of the genus Homo. So, that was Australopithecus. We now come to uh, the genus Homo and there are multiple species in the genus, genus Homo such as Homo erectus, Homo ergaster. This is about 2 million years ago. That was uh, the upright date was about 4 million years ago. I have spent uh, 2.5 minutes and I have come to 2 million years ago. Um, uh, the the in individuals of the genus Homo were able to use stone tools. So, we were we became tool makers um, and uh, the, the, the uh, Homo erectus was quite spread out throughout the world and uh, uh, 1.8 million years ago uh, fossil remains of Homo erectus have been found as far as in Java. Once the first species in the, uh, in the genus Homo appeared, it began to spin off new varieties of Homo. Some of these new varieties all of you are familiar with. I talked about Homo erectus, you have heard about the Heidelberg man, you have heard about the Neanderthals and of course, you have heard about us, we are all us, that is homo, homo, homo sapiens. So, we uh, continuously evolved to newer and newer species and of course, our common ancestors, the gorillas and the chimpanzees continue to evolve uh, in a different line, but along with us in a different line of descent, but along with us. So, we come to uh, um, this, this, this particular uh, branching. So, uh, here is uh, our, here are our ancestors, uh, Homo erectus and so on. The Homo erectus, Homo ergaster, those species then 
give rise to Neanderthal um, um, Heidelberg man. The Heidelberg man in turn uh, gave rise to Neanderthals and I will speak about the Denisov ones in a minute and of course to the Homo sapiens as well. The uh, Homo erectus also spun off other kinds of species, but as you will see none of these species exist today. Of course, the Neanderthal man and the Denisovans do not exist today, but you will see that or you will notice that uh, this particular branch of the tree uh, sort of these branches uh, got intertwined within the Homo sapiens branch and this was a controversy until recently and I will uh, talk about uh, uh, that controversy a little bit which was actually settled not by fossil remains, but by uh, studying genomes. So, this is uh, the Heidelberg man that gave rise to uh, the Homo sapiens, the Neanderthals and the Denisovans and all of these people um, became extinct. Of course, the uh, Neanderthals and the Denisovans also became extinct. So, this branching took place about between 400,000 and 300,000 years ago. When I talk about these dates, these dates have uh, a very large range because you are never sure what the exact date is because uh, of the uncertainties of evidence that we generate uh, these data from. Uh, and and uh, humans then arose between 150,000 uh, to 100, uh, 130,000 years ago. So, this is this is the Heidelberg man. Now, starts the second part of our story because I have told you that about 150 to 130,000 years ago, we evolved from the uh, from from our most common most recent common ancestor. So, this is the part two of our story that begins now. This is the origin of the modern humans. Anatomically modern humans arose in Africa about 130,000 years ago. How do we know that we arose in, uh, um, we evolved in Africa through various kinds of fossil records, but I will also justify using genes and you will see that it is consistent. The genetic evidence is also consistent with humankind arising in Africa and moving out of Africa to other parts of the world. We are less heavily built, we are more mobile and we have a higher cognitive flexibility and this is, this is one of the uh, again fossil remains. Uh, they are different colors because you do not get the entire skull in one go uh, bits and pieces and then there is a lot of joining of these bits and pieces to reconstruct the skull, the skull and this was discovered in uh, 1967 by a member of the same family the famous Leaky family. Uh, a very nice film has actually been made uh, got many academy awards uh, Robert Redford and Meryl Streep called Out of Africa. So, we evolved in Africa and we came out of Africa uh, to populate all parts of the world and uh, we evolved in Africa about 130,000 years ago. When did we come out of Africa? I will tell you in a minute. So, we evolved somewhere in Africa and most likely in the Ethiopia Kenya region that is where the uh, most of the fossils have been found. Uh, we were a small group of people, our ancestors were hunter gatherers um, and they looked like us. Uh, they had a high forehead, sharp uh, chin, like graceful bodies and this is a beautiful uh, one of us. Uh, it is probably one of our great great grandfathers. Uh, so, that is that that is how we looked like many generations ago. At that time when we evolved there were many other human lights that lived elsewhere in Africa and they had already come out of Africa and populated Asia and Europe at that time even before we came out of Africa. Uh, they were notably noticeably different from us. Uh, they had a low forehead, heavy ridges around the eyes and so on and so forth. Um, these people or these individuals, uh, we have heard their names, the Neanderthals. Uh, there were about a million of these archaic humans. These are, they were not really Homo sapiens, they were archaic humans, hominids, um, our, our ancestors in some ways. Uh, there were 1 million of these archaic humans who, uh, most of whom lived outside of Africa, some in Africa, and uh, they all uh, vanished. And the last of them vanished about 30,000 years ago. Uh, so, we I will tell you again when we came out of Africa, we came out of Africa probably between 80,000 and 60,000 years ago and within 30,000 years ago something happened to these 1 million uh, individuals after we came out of Africa and what happened to them we will never know. Uh, perhaps we humans, homo sapiens, uh, we over reproduced, outnumbered them and killed them. This was the most favored hypothesis that humankind came out of Africa and because we were we used tools and we were uh, great re reproducers, uh, we outnumbered them and actually killed them. Uh, we will test this hypothesis and uh, in, in a minute and I will show you what the uh, most recent conclusions are. We came out of Africa like I said, we came out of Africa between 80,000 and 60,000 years ago. Um, today there are 6 maybe 7 billion of us 
across any nook and corner of uh, uh, of the earth's surface that you look to check we are there. Every one of us descended from this small group of anatomically modern humans. That is a very sobering thought that we evolved in Africa, came out of Africa and there are 7 billion of us now. Um, millions of humans have lived and died, but fossilized remains of only a few hundred exist. So, fossil remains are not easy to find. Uh, they do not preserve well, they are not found easily, you cannot plan uh, fossil finds and so on and so forth. So, but uh, 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 reconstruction of human footprints on the sands of time uh, traditionally has been done using such data, fossil remains data, broken skull, a broken bone, etc. Uh, so, these uh, this this kind of reconstruction using fossil data imposes a heavy burden of uh, speculation. At that time, there was nothing else that we could rely on. So, even if it, it imposed a heavy burden of speculation, this is how human evolution has been reconstructed traditionally. But there is now another source which is uh, DNA and this the rest of my talk will now concentrate on DNA evidence in, in reconstructing human evolution. So, like I said we came out of Africa about between 80 and 60 thousand years ago and so what we saw was that we were not alone. There were hominid species archaic humans uh, whom we met uh, and we met at least two other uh, species of hominid cousins in Eurasian landmass. One of them all of us have uh, heard which are the Neanderthals. The second many of us may not have heard um, was found in a cave in Siberia called the Denisova cave and uh, this was a small finger bone that was found in the Denisovan cave and these individuals are now called Denisovans because we now know that this finger bone did not belong to a Neanderthal and how do we know that? We know that by comparing their genomes. There are just too many differences between the Neanderthal genome and uh, the DNA that was isolated from here and the DNA and, and the genome sequence, there are just too many dif differences between the Neanderthal genome and the Denisovan genome for us to say that they belong to the same species, they, they did not. So, the Denisovans were probably uh, not probably most likely a second species uh, that uh, uh, existed whom we met after we came out of Africa. Uh, now, we know again uh, using all kinds of uh, DNA evidence that the Neanderthals um, donated some of their um, genomes to the Denisovans and also some of their genomes to the humans. So, the human genome, Denisovan genomes introgressed into the human genome, the Denisovan, the Neanderthal genome introgressed into the human genome, the Denisovan genome introgressed into the human genome and there was also introgression of the Neanderthal genome into the Denisovan genome. This is what has been found. Uh, again, I will tell you in a little bit more uh, detail what, what this is all about, but interestingly enough there was also another, uh, so so the, the issue that we came out of Africa, outnum over reproduced, outnumbered them and killed them cannot be tenable because uh, the fact that we our genome contained bits and pieces of the Denisovan genome and the Neanderthal genome implied that we actually uh, mated with each other and in uh, when we mated with each other that is how introgression of genes um, take place from one genome to another and since we mated with each other we actually made love not war. The interesting part is that there was also in the human genome uh, uh, piece, bits and pieces of DNA were found that most likely belong to an unknown hominin uh, an, an archaic uh, human and what that is was not known at that time, but I will tell you a little bit story. Uh, with which uh, several of us are involved and I will tell you a little bit of a, a, of, of the story that uh, we have reconstructed. Um, so, Homo sapiens was uh, reproductively more successful, but then we absorbed the uh, Denisovans and the Neanderthals into our own uh, human population. So, how do we make these inferences? I am telling you these stories about genes, but how do we actually infer? So, the inference is uh, the, the standard way the standard way of inferring in all of science which is uh, we generate some data from um, and then we generate some data from we set up a study design generate some genome scale data we set up plausible scenarios. So, one scenario could be that you know we exterminated them the other scenario is that we absorbed uh, the Denisovans and the Neanderthal. So, we set up plausible scenarios and we we have generated the data we have set up a plausible scenario. So, we ask ourselves the the data does it uh, um, uh, uh, is it more for likely to have come from one particular scenario than another and wherever there is greater uh, likelihood support we choose that. So, we use these kinds of maximum likelihood statistical procedures in order to draw these inferences. 
Uh, our inferences come from raw genome data. So, our raw genome data, so these are like every row belongs to an individual. This is a portion of the genome. Most of the data are useless. And the reason why most of the data are useless is because most of the data are not even variable across individuals. Um, unless there is variability across individuals, that particular position or the nucleotide or the, the base in the DNA carries no information for us to draw inferences about the evolution. So, um, as you can see that in this particular uh, data set, there are a few variable positions, but most positions across individuals have exactly the same nucleotide C for example, in this particular position. So, it is these positions that are informative for drawing inferences about evolution and we uh, bank our inferences only on those variable positions. And how many of those variable positions can we find? The entire stretch of DNA is about 3 billion nucleotides and we can find about 4 or 5 million of these variable positions and that is that is uh, uh, large enough um, information for us to draw uh, fairly robust inferences about human evolution. And like I said, uh, we uh, we set up two different kinds of scenarios for those of you who, who are at the back you probably cannot see. So, there is this is a tree, this is a uh, tree of evolution. There is one particular uh, set of species that are in the middle and here it is um, sort of external to this the, to this branch and then you generate data and identify which of the two data sets satisfy which of the two scenarios more. Uh, so, it is the same data what particular scenario does it uh, support more and based on that we uh, draw these kinds of inferences. So, for example, if you have these three genomes let us say and as you can see that in these uh, this is essentially a black genome a red genome and a green genome, but the black genome has bits of red and green and the red genome has bits of black and re, uh, green and so on. And similarly, the, the green gene has uh, uh, bits and pieces of the red and black. So, we can ask ourselves and again uh, it is quite obvious where this particular bit or this particular bit comes from most likely it comes from here and we can actually draw uh, generate sequence data and show that this generate sequence data on multiple individuals and show that that is true. So, this particular bit most likely comes from here, this, uh, these bits come from here and so on. So, we know uh, the, what, what our common sense tells us by looking at this picture is uh, what will also pan out if we actually sequence those uh, genomes and, uh, and, and uh, to compare them in order to identify what is the most, most likely evidence of uh, most likely um, uh, place from where this particular bit may have um, arisen. Um, so, um, uh, this the, these three genomes are like the Neanderthal genome, the Denisovan genome and the human genome. The Neanderthals and the humans they mated with each other and that is how there was introgression. Now, what happened to the children? What happened to the children most likely is that they went with the human group. And again, uh, how do we know this? Because if you look at different uh, uh, layers of individual uh, humans uh, on, on different time scales, uh, what happens is that there is dilution of the of the Neanderthal genome and increase in the human genome. So, the most likely scenario is that the offspring of a Neanderthal cross human mating actually went with the humans and uh, uh, mated with the humans and became absorbed with the humans. So, the genetic evidence right now uh, says that we actually did not beat them up and kill them. We actually um, you know uh, um, uh, brought them into our own species and they became a part of our own species the Neanderthals and the Denisovans. Um, I will skip this. Um, okay. So, then what we started doing was we were uh, having identified uh, or having uh, you know joined a big gang of people to identify the Neanderthal Denisovans and the, uh, and, and the um, source of these bits and pieces. Um, we were we had also sequenced um, people from the uh, Andaman and Nicobar Islands, uh, the tribals, the Jarwas and the Ongis from the Andaman and Nicobar Islands and we uh, I did uh, sequence a large number of uh, ethnic groups from India, uh, people from uh, different ethnic groups in India. What we found in the Jarwa and Onge genome are two small pieces that cannot be cannot could not have come from the Neanderthals or the Denisovans. We have done extensive work. And we looked at mainland Indian population, none of the mainland Indian populations had this yellow piece. So, no individual in mainland India had this yellow piece, yet the Jarwas and Onges had these two mysterious, uh, not two, there are several pieces of uh, DNA or several of these small pieces in the DNA of the Jarwas and the Onges that cannot be attributed either to mainland Indian populations or to Neanderthals or to Denisovans. So, we were wondering where this came from. So, one of the first questions that we asked is, 
what's the antiquity of these yellow pieces and again I am not going to go into the gory details of it. These are uh, these use again uh, the sequence data and statistical methods in order to estimate time and uh, essentially what we found was that these two uh, yellow pieces their antiquity dated back to the Neanderthal Denisovan that time scale. Um, so, it evidently could not have come from the humans themselves, but when we looked at Southeast Asia and we collaborated with groups in Southeast Asia, there was a, a, a major reason why we collaborated with groups in Southeast Asia and not let us say Europe. Um, what we found was that these yellow pieces were also present in many of the Southeast Asian tribal populations, especially the negrito tribal populations. And uh, you will recall that uh, Jarwas and Onges are negrito tribal populations living in the Andaman and Nicobar Islands. So, is it possible that this came from here? No, again our analysis uh, showed us that the antiquity of these two go back to Neanderthals and Denisovans and therefore, it could not have come from the modern humans in uh, resident in Southeast Asia. Uh, so, more likely the Southeast Asian populations also got these uh, uh, these bits and pieces of the yellow from the same ancestor that uh, that donated these uh, bits and pieces of yellow to the Jarwas uh, and the Ongis. Um, we actually uh, proposed that there was a third. Um, uh, remember that we talked about a potential unknown hominin in that figure that I showed you uh, a couple of minutes ago. So, we proposed that along with the Neanderthals and the and, and the Denisovans, there are other archaic humans that roamed around, they, they were different species and they also mated with the humans um, and uh, these yellow pieces have come from uh, as a result of that kind of mating. So, we published this paper uh, last year, oops, um, I am not going to explain this, uh, this is a detailed reconstruction of what we think uh, 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 happened to the archaic human. Um, while we did this work, our paper was published in September. The American Society of Human Genetics meets every uh, October in different parts of uh, United States and in October 2016, uh, the next month, um, there was a uh, the American Society meeting was held and there was a poster that was there in the American Society meeting uh, that was uh, in held in October like I said and in that they studied um, uh, groups of Melanesians and this is what they found. So, this is Melanesian tribals, those are the, Mel the Melanesian islands. And what they concluded is that genetic study reveals ancient Melanesians interbred with a mysterious hominid. Remember the uh, um, Andaman and Nicobar Islands is here, this is Melanesia. So, it is very interesting. They have not released their data yet. So, as soon as they release their data, one of the things that we intend to do is to find out whether the kind of uh, data that they have generated where, where which they attribute to this mysterious hominid, whether those are the yellow pieces that we have found in our Jarwa and Onge. Uh, um, uh, genomes as well, but they have not uh, they have not actually uh, released their data. So, we believe this is only a belief as of now that this mysterious hominid is the same mysterious hominid that uh, donated uh, you know their genomes to bits and pieces of their genomes to the Jarwan Onge genomes. So, that is interesting that we found genetics has helped there is no fossil evidence yet genetics has uh, been able to identify the possibility of a, a third archaic hominin that introgressed whose genomes introgressed with the humans into the humans. So, I am going to uh, come now to the last part of my talk which is in recent time uh, more recent uh, humans are unusual and animals. We have a wide geographical distribution and we have adapted ourselves to a wide range of environmental conditions. Uh, we know that we we occupy every nook and corner of this planet. Um, however, one interesting thing that characterizes us also characterizes the chimpanzees by the way we probably uh, uh, you know inherited that from the chimpanzees which is that we choose mates from our own group. However, that group is defined as a social group. So, we choose mates uh, from within our own group. Um, the groups uh, well as a result of humans tending to mate within their own groups what happens is that genetic variations that evolve within the group tends to remain localized within those groups and so, these groups retain some measure of genetic distinctiveness. That is how genetic diversity across human population groups have arisen because because of the social structure that we uh, that we have because all of us have a common ancestor, but after having descended from a common ancestor, ancestor we have sort of grouped ourselves into social groups and we mate within our own group. Uh, so, if you look at populations uh, evolution of populations over time and I am trying to fix our notion as to how we draw these inferences. I am going to look forward in time, but what we actually study are contemporary populations 
genomes of individuals in contemporary populations and reverse the arrow of time. But let us look at what happens when we look forward in time. So, this is a population that we are that is going to evolve and we are going to look at the evolution of that population, but we are going to look forward in time. So, when this population uh, well, this population then demographically expands, we are still hunter gatherers, um, there is pressure on natural resources. So, one of the things that we do is because there is pressure in the, on natural resources, we are unable to find nuts and berries and animals to kill and eat and survive, we break out from that group and go elsewhere and we found a new colony and in that colony then there, there is more natural resources and we are able to eat. So, this is how we believe that human evolution is taking place. Uh, we, we move, we migrate to a new place, uh, reproduce, in our numbers increase, there is pressure on natural resources, we again move out. And once we move out, then we tend to, so this is the original group, this is the move out group or uh, the emigrated group. So, this group now stand, tends to remain and mate within themselves, whatever genetic variation happens within them due to natural forces such as mutation, uh, the, th those tend to remain localized because there is no admixture, there is no uh, movement uh, of genes from one uh, through, through matings from one population to another. Sometimes of course, there is movement of genes and when there is movement of genes, of course, genes from here will move and they, 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 they these two groups now uh, will tend to become mod, uh, will tend to homogenize with respect to their genetic variation. So, we, we do have, we can model all of these processes, uh, but uh, uh, again like I said, admixture or exchange of genes is not common. Uh, major barriers of admixture, geographical barriers uh, are a major, uh, f physical barriers are a major barrier to admixture. Imagine two groups living on two, two sides of the Himalayan mountain belt. Uh, of course, there is very little scope for them to uh, meet and uh, reproduce and exchange genes. So, physical barriers are a major barrier. Uh, cultural differences and linguistic differences, language is a part of culture. Cultural differences um, are a barrier to admixture and uh, so, um, if you do not have the same religion, if you do not speak the same language, then of course, you do not tend to uh, uh, mate or marry uh, between uh, different cultural uh, groups or linguistic groups. So, those there are some uh, major barriers to admixture. Um, one of the things that we expect is that if there is a lot of genetic diversity, then older populations should uh, should have should possess greater amount of within population diversity. By within population diversity, I mean that this particular group has a large number of individuals. If we sequence the genomes of these individuals who all belong to a particular group, then if the group is very old, then there has been a lot of time, a lot of elapsed time during which many mutations would have accumulated and therefore, there will be a lot of genetic diversity. Reversing the time arrow, reversing the expectation where there is great amount of within population genetic diversity, you would uh, conclude that that particular population is older. So, I am going to show you some data on within population genetic diversity now in different parts of the world. Um, so, this is Africa and of course, in Africa you expect a huge amount of genetic diversity. Why? Because we evolved there. Why? Because uh, a lot of time has elapsed for mutations to accumulate. So, the within population genetic diversity is very high in Africa. Next to Africa is Asia and if you uh, subdivide Asia, most of the data actually comes from India. Um, so, India has the highest amount of genetic diversity after Africa. So, what is the conclusion? Indian populations are very old. Now, we know that one of the first waves of migration that came out of Africa actually entered India. That is the antiquity of the Indian populations compared to the other populations. Um, do we have other kinds of data to corroborate this? The answer is yes. So, if I look at male population movements as tracked by signatures on the Y, chromosome, y chromosomal DNA. Uh, these are signatures, uh, some kind of specific motifs in, in the DNA sequence uh, uh, that is embedded in the Y chromosome. So, any, any male movement will, will carry these kinds of signatures. So, these are older signatures by starting uh, these signatures, you can actually date the signatures. So, these are older signatures, these are newer signatures. So, uh, as we move from left to right, this is from the more uh, old signatures and these are the newest signatures. If you plot these signatures on the map of um, map of the world, what you find is that the oldest signatures such as these are, um, uh, are, in, uh, are in Africa and the newest signatures such as these are in the new world. So, the oldest uh, signatures are here, the newest signatures are here in the new world. Remember, humans cross the um, um, Bering Strait, 
which was still landlocked uh, Bering Strait and walked into the uh, into the Americas to populate the Americas. So this is uh, humankind coming out of Africa, um, uh, you know, moving, uh, remaining in this particular region of Central Asia into India and then moving uh, moving into uh, the New World uh, much later. Uh, all of these uh, timings have also been done, but I'm not showing you the timings. This is about 15,000 years ago when we crossed the Bering Strait. So this is male population movement completely consistent with movement out of Africa to populate other parts of the world. Let's look at female population movement. Female population movement can be tracked by looking at the mitochondrial DNA. Uh, I'm not going to go into the gory details of mitochondrial DNA. Mitochondria are organelles that are outside of the nucleus in the cytoplasm that contains DNA. It's a circular DNA. It's a small DNA, but we all receive our mitochondria fr from our mothers. So uh, this is essentially tracking female movements. And if you look at, uh, again, it, uh, these are signatures of the mitochondrial DNA. Older signatures are here. Newer signatures are here. Same story. Um, the oldest signatures are, are, uh, are in Africa. The middle aged signatures are in Asia and Europe and the newest signatures are in the new world. Again, completely consistent with um, humankind um, evolving in Africa, moving out of Africa to populate other parts of the world. Come to India, which is really the last bit of my talk. Um, uh, we look at uh, tribal population. So I'm just explaining uh, the kind of sampling that we do. So we do, uh, we sample the tribal populations and we sample the caste populations. Uh, a large number of them and these tribal populations speak different languages. The caste populations also speak different languages. So the tribal populations such as the Santas, Mundas, Lodas, these populations speak languages or dialects that belong to the Austro-Asiatic language of speech. Um, but, uh, tribal populations such as the Kotas, the Kurumbas, the Todas, these are tribal populations from Nilgiri Hills or from hills of the Andhra Pradesh. Uh, they speak languages that belong to uh, the Dravidian family. Uh, the northeast tribal populations such as the Mizos, the Riangs, etc., the Tripuris, uh, they speak languages that belong to the tibeto burman language family and uh, there, are, there are very, very few tribal populations that speak Indo-European languages. Halba is one of them, but many of us believe that this language was imposed on them uh, uh, as opposed to their dialect being originally Indo-European and we have reasons to believe that, again coming from genetic studies, but I will not, uh, not even describe that. Then among the caste populations, the South Indian caste populations speak the Dravidian languages such as the Ayars and the Ayangars. Uh, Manipuri Brahmins of Northeast India speak the Tibeto Burman language. And uh, the, the North Indian populations such as the Rajput, the Koknas, Brahmins of uh, Maharashtra, they speak Indo-European language. I am absolutely certain that you have noticed two things. One is that there is a complete confounding between language and geography. North Indian populations speak Indo-European languages. Uh, South Indian populations, irrespective of whether it's a tribal population or a caste population, speak Dravidian languages and the Northeast Indian population speak uh, Tibeto-Burman languages. The second point that I want to point out, the second fact that I want to point out is that Austroasiatic languages are spoken exclusively um, uh, by the tribals, uh, such as the Santas, Mundas and, uh, and, and Lodas. Ethnic composition of India, these numbers come from a nationwide survey that was uh, that was uh, conducted uh, about a decade ago, maybe a decade and a half ago uh, by the Anthropological Survey of India. Uh, the, there are about uh, 450 estimated tribal populations in India. They have simple so social organization and occupation and I have already described the language groups that they uh, speak. The caste populations including sub castes have been estimated to be about 4000. They have a more complex hierarchical social organization. The uh, tribal populations do not have a hierarchical social organization and these uh, the caste populations have varied kinds of occupations. These are the languages that they speak and then we have a uh, number of uh, religious and migrant groups again estimated to be about 150. Uh, they also have complex social organization and carry out a variety of occupations. <coughs> So, um, we have sampled uh, po populations, uh, tribal populations over a long period of time, uh, almost two or three decades um, and have analyzed uh, data. Right now what we do is we actually sequence the genomes, uh, but earlier we did not sequence their genomes, we uh, genotyped a large number of loci in these individuals. One of the things that we have been interested in and all of us are interested in, uh, we have multiple ancestors, not every, every of course, we all, if you look back in time, we all uh, come from come from Africa. But subsequent to that, there have been many uh, migrations, and we have many ancestors that are that are that are common in more recent times. 
So one of the questions <coughs> that we ask is um, uh, how many di distinct ancestral types are there and how many distinct types can we identify from the football, footfalls. So before this, this question we were not the first to ask this question. Um, um, simultaneously with us uh, there were other groups and we were beaten, beaten hollow. Um, this was uh, this was published, uh, this was a collaboration between CCMB in Hyderabad Center for Cellular and Molecular Biology and the Broad Institute of Harvard and MIT. Uh, they, they collaborated and reconstructed in India's population and their reconstruction uh, told us that we all evolved from a mixture of two ancestral groups one of which they called as the ancestral North Indian and the second they called as ancestral South Indian and they posited that all of India was um, essentially evolved from two uh, mixture of these two ancestral populations. Uh, this was unbelievable for people like me uh, you know, when spending a lot of time looking at uh, tribal populations and caste populations. We, will, uh, we uh, I firmly believe that this was an underestimate of the number of ancestral populations. You, um, when you look at their paper, they did not even have one single tribal population uh, in their sample and how can you draw an inference about uh, human population structure or ancestral structure of India without even sampling a tribal. So we knew that uh, this was an underestimate. We uh, went ahead and uh, collected our own data, much better sampling including uh, first of all tribal populations were not included. No population from the northeast of India was included in the previous study and therefore they, uh, it was only um, uh, natural to expect that uh, their, their number of ancestral populations was underestimated. Anyway, so we uh, did a much better sampling and uh, you know we, we looked at a large number of markers, uh, genotyped a large number of markers and one of the things that we first saw um, is that the, these are the island populations, Andaman and Nicobar Islands. So let me explain what this graph is all about. This is the first principal component and this is the second principal component. Again, it is essentially a summary of a very large number of um, geno genotype data at a very large number of loci. How many loci? About 600,000 loci. Um, it is a first summary, the, the summary that explains the maximum amount of variation among the in the data set that we are looking at and this is the second principal component. It is again a summary statistic that explains the second most uh, amount of variation. So we usually plot uh, based on uh, the first two principal components. Each dot here represents an individual and what you can see is that the individuals of the Andaman and Nicobar Islands are very separated from the individuals of mainland India. So these are all individuals from mainland India and these are the uh, population groups that uh, color coded population groups to which these individuals belong. The second result is that we uh, um, identified or, or we estimated again using statistical methods that it is uh, the number of ancestral populations is 4 and not 2 and I will explain this that uh, this these are called admixture estimates. So let me explain what this graph is all about. There are many, many, many individuals along the x axis and therefore many columns each column representing an individual. This goes this is an admixture proportion goes from 0 to 1. And what you will see is that there are the at this end for example, it is only one uniform color. So this indi individual's genome has one uniform color. Similarly, this individual's genome has one uniform color. This individual's genome has one uniform color and if you look closely, this in, these individuals have uh, the one, one uniform color. This means that uh, the genomes of those individuals are essentially unadmixed while individuals of this kind uh, where you find this is the proportion of the red genome, this is the proportion of the green genome, this is the proportion of the blue genome and this is the proportion of uh, the genome with whatever that color is green uh, like, like blue. What are these uh, colors all about? So you can look at which are the in unad unadmixed individuals, which individuals are so called pure individuals and where do they come from, what kind of um, uh, back genetic ba ethnic background do they have. And we did that and essentially were able to identify that these individuals, the green genomes are the Indo-European genomes, the Dravidian genomes are the red ones, the Austroasiatic genomes are these, uh, the, the light blue color are the green color and the Tibetoburmans are the uh, dark blue color. So essentially there are four populations, four ancestral populations. Uh, again, like I told you that uh, the uh, languages are completely confounded with geography. 
So, of course, uh, the Indo Europeans and the Dravidians are two ancestral populations, and the Austro Asiatic populations, again, the tribals of um, uh, Northeast India and Central India who speak the Austro Asiatic languages uh, are a separate ancestral component, and the Northeast Indian populations, the Tibetan Burman population, are a fourth component. So, essentially, there are four um, ancestral populations um, uh, in, 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 uh, that comprise. Uh, all of mainland India and the Jarwas and the Onges and uh, uh, those po those tribal populations have a completely separate um, ancestry, uh, separate from uh, the the ancestries of uh, the mainland Indian population. So we published this last year. My last part of the talk, last three minutes, um, <coughs> is uh, with respect to human population movements. Um, in the, when, when there is population expansion, I said that there is pressure on natural resources. They move to new areas. They stay put in those areas, and if there is a um, uh, mixing, uh, if there is mating between those two um, separate groups, then of course uh, there is uh, homogenization of their genomes. So that's how th that's a standard thing. Then, uh, uh, when culture developed, uh, we we develop different kinds of innovations, uh, and I'll talk about one kind of innovation. We develop develop one kind of you know different kinds of innovations, and those innovations then get exported to other geographical areas. When there is export of an innovative idea uh, to another uh, geographical area, it, it, it evolves in one area, moves to another geographical area. That is what I mean by export. That export can take place in one of two ways. One way is that it, it, it spreads by uh, word of mouth. So, it is like cultural, that has been called uh, as cultural diffusion. So, it is a diffusion of ideas with no physical movement of people. Yeah, people do not move, it is just word of mouth. Uh, TVs did not exist, but today of course, it can move faster through TVs, etc. The second is called demic diffusion and that is diffusion of ideas through actual movement of people. And when there is actual movement of people, genes of course, move with people. So, you move to a new geographical area and you leave your footprint, your gene print right there through matings. Um, and, and so, that is that, how we are able to figure out whether there has been demic diffusion or cultural diffusion. One of the major innovations, one of the major, major innovations that took place in our cultural history was the invention of agriculture. Um, in that invention of agriculture took place, this is modern agriculture. Primitive agriculture took, uh, uh, you know, evolved in multiple places uh, of the world, including at least two or three places even in India. But that sort of died because of the advent of modern agriculture. And I am not going to define what modern agriculture is. It, it involves technologies of farming and so on and so forth. More agriculture in its modern form arose in this region called the Fertile Crescent region, Syria, Lebanon, Turkey. That is the region where modern agriculture evolved. What we find is that in this particular region, there is a specific genetic signature. Again, I am not going to give you the details of the genetic signature. There is a very uh, specific genetic signature that is at a very high frequency in the Fertile Crescent region. And the, this particular signature arose almost simultaneously at the same time when agriculture evolved, which has been dated to, to, to about 8 to 10,000 years ago. So, this signature also arose around the same time. And so, what we believe is that this uh, signature represents this Fertile, fertile Crescent region. And humans who move, move out of this fertile crescent region will carry this signature along with them. And when you look at this signature, and if you look at its, uh, uh, you know, frequencies in in other parts as you move out of the fertile crescent region, the signature of course diminishes. And so what what we believe is that again, I, I don't don't have the time to tell you. We can um, uh, we can even time the movement of this particular signature into other at least not not very near, but far away places. We can actually time when this movement took place, and this is all consistent with the movement of agriculture as well. Uh, one of the questions that we asked is. Um, there has been a lot of writing about primitive agriculture being being indigenous to India, which is true. There is a lot of primitive agriculture, seeds of primitive agriculture uh, indigenous to India. So, there, there was a little bit of a controversy whether at all this wave of modern agriculture actually came into India or whether the primitive agriculture evolved in its modern form and that is what we practice all over India. Uh, we wanted to test that genetically. Because what we said is that if indeed this wave came into India, then we should find diminishing um, uh, frequencies of this particular signature. If 
the primitive agriculture actually spread through India in its and, and was modernized, then there should be discontinuity of this particular uh, trend that we see. And this is what we did. <coughs> well, we published this a few years ago. So this is uh, where we stood when we started our work, and this is what where we ended up. So essentially, what we see is that that same the colors have changed, but that same uh, signature actually percolated into India as well. So in spite of the fact that India was seat of primitive agriculture, but agriculture that we now practice in its modern form actually did not spread from that uh, primitive uh, agriculture or even if it did not in a major way, but the major wave actually came into India and we are able to draw these kinds of inferences using um, signatures and genomes and this is this is demic diffusion. Agriculture was an innovative idea which was carried to other parts of the world including India and as you can see that there is a very nice gradation of this particular signature that is uh, genetic signature that is associated with, um, with uh, a movement of agriculture. This is my last slide and my most important slide. Yeah? What I have shown is evolution. What I have also shown is that some of the cultural trends can, can be inferred by their signatures and genomes. But this is my most important slide and I am going to, I know that all of you can read English, but I am going to read this out for you. It is by an American, African American poet. Uh, Maya Angelou and this is uh, this is from uh, page 119 uh, 19 from this book. It is time for the preachers, the rabbis, the priests and pundits and the professors to believe in the awesome wonder of diversity so that they can teach those who follow them. It is time for parents to teach young people early on that in diversity there is beauty and there is strength. We all should know that diversity makes for a rich tapestry and we must understand that all the threads of the tapestry are equal in value no matter their color, equal in importance no matter their texture. Thank you very much. Well, thank you Professor Majumdar, that is an amazing, amazing, amazing talk which I am sure set a lot of people thinking about these issues. Um, he can take a few questions from the audience. So there are some traveling mics. Please put up your hand right at the corner. Yes. Uh, hello, sir. Uh, you talked about uh, languages, geographical positions, and genomes. Could you please elaborate a little bit more? I talked about uh, uh, genomes, so geographical for positions, example, and uh, uh, languages. Languages. Yeah. Yes. So what I said was that if you look at India. And if you look at the distribution of languages, it is completely superimposed on geographies. How? The no, if you look at the Tibeto Burman language, Tibeto Burman language is almost exclusively spoken in the Northeast region. So, if you talk about the Northeast region, you are actually talking about the Tibeto Burman language. If you come to South India, the Dravidian language is completely superimposed on South India. So, if you talk about Dravidian language, you are actually talking about South India or if you ask what language does anybody speak, any of the ethnic groups speak in South India, it is Dravidian invariably. So, there is a complete confounding between uh, Dravidian populations and the geography. So, if you study genomes, you do not know whether you are talking about geography or language because of the confounding and that is those are the three coordinates that I talked about. Two of them are completely confounded. So, one of them you cannot separate the genome into a language component and a geography component because of the confounding and that is what I see. Um, from the standpoint of uh, offspring, uh, <coughs> given all the studies that you have done, uh, have you been able to reach an opinion as to whether marriage between <coughs> very diverse uh, uh, genetic uh, sequences is better or marriage within better. Uh, groups uh, uh, is better? So, better is a very value loaded uh, word. So, we do not even know what better means. Uh, there are certain diseases such as that are called recessive diseases where you need the same genetic combination to appear on both chromosomes for one to precipitate or show that disease. So, if you look at uh, populations that are that are that marry within among themselves and do not outbreed, it is completely inbred population, you find the frequencies of these diseases to be high. So, in that sense it is not good 
because inbreeding leads to these recessive diseases. But again, somebody we, we can argue in multiple ways, and like I said, that uh, better or worse is is a value loaded word. So, yeah. But that but this is true, and what what can be shown? So we also have arguments. We also have reasons why this is true. Why inbreeding leads to a higher prevalence of recessive disorders? These are called recessive disorders because you need two copies to uh, to pre uh, show the disease to manifest the disease, and the chance of two copies coming together higher in inbred populations than in outbred populations. <coughs> Excuse me, sir. Yes, sir. Ah, yeah, yeah. I know that uh, advances in genetic engineering have given the hope that. Human lifespan can increase up to 250 years or so. Uh, it's not on the horizon, so I am out of that. But I am worried about the younger population here. Uh, is it likely to come? I am saying worried because, uh, given the un unemployment rate, if they live for 250 yes, years, how do they? So um, uh, again, you said it's a hope. I also think it's a hope. When that hope is about to come true. We will put a moratorium on that hope. Humankind will put a moratorium on that hope. We have been doing this. We have put moratorium on moratoria on many, many things that we should not indulge in. My, my question is that uh, has there similar studies been done for animals and plants, especially like domesticated uh, animals and uh, food crops because and uh, does it correlate with human uh, movement? Does it correlate with? With the, the uh, human movement in the ge geographical uh, 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 Not very much. I mean, uh, we do not know, uh, other than modern agriculture, we do not know whether we carry a banyan tree from one geographical space to another. At least humans do not. So, human migration and plant migration will not correlate very well um, on, on, other than domesticated crops. Domesticated crops, yes. And uh, along with domesticated cr crops came a large number of diseases such as malaria. Yeah, because you need stagnation of water, uh, so th there is a lot of correlation. But again, th that was not the major focus of my talk today. Before passing the uh, mic, I can ask you a, a related question. One of the things that you alluded to but did not actually explicitly talk about are actually movements of uh, these particular individual ethnic groups or genetic groups from Africa. So the implication is that the tribal groups, the Austro uh, Asiatic groups, came earlier. Did they go through India and go into, uh, say, the Southeast Asian population and Australian? Is there any way of knowing that? And then when the Dravidian group came and when the Indo-European group came? So times are very contentious, primarily because you can't estimate the point estimates of time are very fragile. So we always do an interval estimate of time, and the intervals are very broad. So if you look at the, if you have estimated Austroasiatic entry into India, Dravidian entry into India, you would find a large overlap. Indo-Europeans do not have that kind of overlap, but Dravidian, Austroasiatic and Tibeto-Burmans, their time of entry has a very large overlap. But these are distinct migrations? These are distinct migrations as far as we can tell because of the, uh, the genomes are quite fairly distinct. I had heard that there were some recent claims that the human evolution actually did not start in Africa itself because of some diversity in the genetic uh, uh, this uh, uh, reservoir. Uh, in a particular tribe known as Khosan in South Africa, and there was a huge genetic split. So the reason uh, was ascribed to the fact that they must have also moved uh, from somewhere else into Africa. And then the bottlenecks with which uh, one assumes that uh, uh, those uh, smaller groups must have shared the same genetic uh, material, uh, those kind of bottlenecks have not been found in other species outside. So have there been some evidences like that against? Uh, I did not make evidence? a comment on that because the overwhelming genetic evidence points to evolution in Africa and then movement out of Africa. So, uh, if that's uh, is that a study in a mainstream genetics journal or uh, a mainstream evolutionary journal? I would like to get a reference from you because I am not aware of that. Hello, professor. Uh, as we understand, uh, humans moved from quadrupeds to being bipeds rather quickly, and this combined with uh, rapid brain growth, this put a lot of uh, stress on the spinal cord. 
so uh, and our spinal cords are uh, rather weak another issue is uh, bipedal posture as well as uh, size of hip bones puts a limitation on uh, size or a width of birth canal so that creates a lot of problems in delivering a baby so uh, looking at evolutionary perspective where are we headed actually uh, or are the are doctors going to be winners in the end only so i'm not going to speculate where we are headed but uh, the, the the things that you said it puts a lot of weight on the spinal cord as a matter of fact it puts a lot of weight on the muscles around uh, the spinal cord as well so low back pain for example is very rampant in the human population having said that the upright gait in terms of selection the uh, offset of selection by low back pain versus ability to you know throw stones at predators and then survive and reproduce that completely offset the uh, low back pain and this pressure it put on the spinal cord so bipedality <laughs> was naturally selected for favored because we were better uh, we were able to reproduce better because of bipedality and that's where we are headed i have no idea to do <laughs> uh, no. hello yeah uh, you know there was uh, some volcanic event about 70000 years ago when the number of breeding pairs reduced uh, dramatically how does that have an impact on all this because uh, it, we said there is something like 15000 breeding pairs only at about that time yeah so uh, yes i i know you're talking about the toba right the toba volcanic eruption uh, so the toba volcanic eruption um, actually we lost a lot of foliage we lost a number of species so people who work on uh, you know a uh, number of animal species and so on we lost a number of animal species because of lack of foliage the sun was covered there was darkness no photosynthesis many many uh, the plants became uh, went extinct um we don't know what impact it had on human evolution because the time scales are very different similarly the ice age the last last ice age was about 4000 years ago we came out of africa about uh, 60 to 80000 years ago so it was in the middle period of our human evolution it's very difficult to estimate what impact it may have had on uh, on human evolution one of the theories was that because of the ice age the neanderthals and the denisovans uh, went extinct but then why did we mate with them or how did so these are questions that we'll never be able to answer but uh, yeah so in terms of the toba um, volcanic eruption we don't know what impact it had on the human so uh, uh, the bipeds moved from africa you know into australia right that must have been 100000 years ago yeah. how did they cross i mean the, the earliest evidence of ships as far as i know goes back to the egyptians right or maybe babylonians and that's just you know the seven eight, so six this seven, also came as a big surprise to all of us <coughs> who think about these things generate data the first wave of migration from out of africa uh, took a southern exit route and that was the uh, humans uh, learned to negotiate water very very rapidly they used boats but these are not boats in any modern sense they were like logs that they could they used to negotiate water so we actually negotiated water and well, went along the coastline of india to andaman nicobar islands and then to papua new guinea so the northern exit route which is what i showed which were the, in terms of the numbers probably that the greater numbers of people came out of uh, that particular route um, but the earlier route was the southern exit route and jarvas and ongis may have been you know on the, on that southern exit route there's also speculation that many of the ravidian populations may actually have evolved from that southern exit route which is very difficult to know could this be related to the ice age because a lot of the water was trapped in ice so the, the seabed was much lower and he may have actually walked across uh, so there is uh, the you know i i don't know that uh, very well i think the uh, time scales are very different um, number one the ice age etc the time scales are very different secondly uh, the sea bed has risen uh, has risen <clears throat> over the last 20000 years or so after before that uh, where we see t- sea today uh, was actually land so people could have actually walked along uh, also uh, there was much less water to negotiate is what many of the geologists etc tell us so the southern exit route today uh, seems like a big surprise but may not have been as big a surprise because they could have walked uh, much much of that but there is water now there was land thank you
Can I ask my question? If you don't mind, I had my hand. Sure. Uh, so you also talked about. Uh, oh yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, you mentioned there is a lot of genetic mixture between these different species, and as we uh, biological concept of species comes, is basically where we have these uh, breeding barriers, and that's what we call species. So looking at your talk, can we really say that all these different uh, ones are really different human species or they are just different races or subspecies or something like that. So again I mean these are uh, definitions first of all <coughs> there was uh, admixture but not a huge amount of admixture. The amount of um, uh, Denisovan genome that we see in our uh, genomes is uh, about 1 percent. The amount of uh, uh, Neanderthal genome that we see in our genome is about 1.2 to 2 percent depending on where you are sampling from. So there was um, not a uniform pattern of admixture with the Neanderthals. So it is not a huge amount. Now in terms of uh, species, subspecies, etc., um, these are again threshold definitions as you know. I mean it is a continuous change and at some point of time there is reproductive isolation and that is when speciation happens. Uh, but even after reproductive isolation even naturally sometimes reproduction can take place between two reproductively isolated populations. So whether you call them as subspecies or species or um, you know groups we do not know that is a matter of nomenclature. But not just species but you have you showed the mixture within individuals. No uh, from, the, from the groups. From Neanderthals, right, Denisovans right. and, and humans. Yes. That is what you were talking yeah. about right? Yeah. Are this far too much racial uh, strife based on presumed superiority can uh, your genomics can the science conclusively prove that this is wrong. Uh, conclusively prove that races are uh, non-existent ra ra right. Racial superiorities. Superiority uh, uh, racial superiority how does one measure racial superiority? It, can it be measured on by using your statistical methods because the otherwise but these then, arguments then, keep on happening. But superiority has to be an external construct and we can test that external construct using genome. So you have to give me the external construct. How do you define uh, superiority of a race? Then we can use genomes in order to test that. Has any effort been done because there is far too much of strife and I suppose something needs to be done. That is the reason why I really put that's, this that's out. That is exactly the reason why Maya Angelou says this right. And that is exactly the reason why this is my most important. How do we make world agree to this? <laughs> ah. so all religion is all religion is less than <laughs> 2000 years old. <laughs> yes, uh, Kavita. Hi, uh, your last but one slide it showed. Uh, you want me to go back? Yes, please. Thank you. Uh, it showed uh, basically traveling of agriculture, right, or diffusion of agriculture, and it uh, agrees with. I mean, uh, the genomic um, diffusion sort of agrees with the uh, agricultural scenario as well, or exactly. Uh, yes, that's you? exactly what I pointed out that. Agriculture arose in the in the um, fertile crescent region, which has a specific signature that's at its highest frequency there. And uh, the hypothesis is that if people are taking agriculture, they are also taking genes, but it's smaller and smaller numbers of individuals who are moving on, and therefore you would expect a gradient, a diminishing gradient or a decreasing gradient in frequency of that particular signature. That's how we concluded that modern agriculture came into India. During the, through that way. Uh, but then can you give the time scales for these modern agriculture and So modern agriculture time scales are again it comes from uh, pollen grain studies and so on and so forth has been dated to about 8000 to 10000 years ago. But uh, that is when actually uh, it is said that the early uh, agriculture took place like in, in, in the beginning of the Holocene right. I am not so talking about primitive agriculture at all. So I am talking about technologically dependent agriculture. Yeah, so that modern agriculture is distinguished from the kind of agriculture that you are talking about which is primitive agriculture and so the controversy was whether primitive agriculture led to this modern agriculture that we find in India today. But uh, the contention or at least this analysis shows that it is more likely that it came into India through that wave of migration where people moved along with the innovation. So you do not agree with the uh, actual uh, you know one of the origins being in India. Of course, I mean, I mean but that is not modern agriculture. Primitive agriculture arose again. I have another slide to show you. I, I will not, I do not have it here. 
there are three, uh, at least we have been able to identify three seeds of primitive agriculture associated with again genomic signatures which disperse, mm -hmm. but then do not disperse too far. So, you. there are seeds of uh, primitive agriculture in India which actually act moved, which actually again followed a demic diffusion model, but did not sustain itself too much. This probably swept through those primitive agricultural forms because you know using this technology the uh, production uh, levels were much higher than primitive pr prim primitive uh, agricultural production levels that's why it swept through i think okay, okay we'll take up last few questions okay there wonderful talk uh, uh, i want to highlight uh, one aspect of intelligence in human beings as human beings have evolved the intelligence has also evolved so, uh, what else intelligence what? as human intelligence, intelligence of human beings. Intelligent, beings. intelligence. Okay, okay. Yes. So, uh, now we can see three parallel feeds uh, of evolving intelligence. Like one is the CRISPR uh, gene editing through which intelligence can be improved. Another is the uh, lab manufactured neurons with through which which can be Im uh, inculcated in human brains and then human can become more intelligent. And third is the uh, uh, artificial super intelligence which is through machines and which is uh, preceded by artificial general intelligence. So basically, so how do we see the picture of these three parallel fields helping us to become uh, more, more intelligent and then solve the pressing problems of science and technology? How do you see the future of this? So uh, my hope is that I won't live till that day. <laughs> that will be a reality for sure because it's, I'm not going to live that long. Second. As I said, and I firmly believe this, that we ourselves will put a moratorium on th those kinds of manipulation. We will do it. I am absolutely certain. Okay, we will take a last question from this persistent person. Yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, so, this slide uh, over here, I am kind of confused about your uh, what you inferred from this data. So, you said that uh, this genetic marker, particular one, um, the way it uh, the way it is uh, different in different uh, areas uh, correlates with the uh, traveling of uh, the diffusion of uh, modern agriculture so i don't understand why this marker should be uh, relevant because uh, uh, you know the uh, the spreading of technology doesn't really depend on the spreading of the genes so why do you think this is uh, relevant marker all right so <clears throat> perhaps I was not clear. So, I am going to take two minutes to explain what I tried to explain in my talk. Two things, innovation, agriculture, modern agriculture was an innovation and it spread to other parts of the world. There was geographical spread of that innovation. I said two things, one is you may say a third thing, but this, these are the two things that we all often think about. One is that innovation can be exported or spread across geographical um, uh, regions by word of mouth no physical movement of people. If there is no physical movement of people, if it is just word of mouth, then there will be no exchange of genes or no uh, movement of genes. Yeah. That is one scenario. The second scenario is that if, uh, if an innovative idea moves across geographical space and if people carry, then there will be movement of genes. So, to be able to distinguish between these scenarios, given that we find that an innovative idea has moved across geographical space, we can use genes. Because if we see that there has been genetic movement, it, it, it is more uh, uh, affine to supporting the hypothesis that this innovation took place with movement of people. If I made that clear, then I will make the second part of my statement. Now, here is a genetic signature. So, independently, uh, the uh, date of evolution of modern agriculture was, uh, has been estimated to be between 8 and 10,000 years ago. There is a genetic signature that one finds. Uh, and this is on the Y chromosome, this is genetic signature, uh, a genetic signature that one finds which also evolved about the same time. How do we date it? We can compare genomic sequences. I did not I didn't actually get into the technology of dating, but we can use genomic sequences to date. So, that genomic signature also arose around the same time. All right. These are two independent events, but then when we put two and two together, what we find is that the place where this particular signature is at its peak the frequency of this signature is, is at its peak is in the same region where agriculture evolved. And then as you move out of that particular region, you find the signature diminishing, which means that even though a large number of people 
have that particular signature in that region in the fertile crescent region as you are carrying this innovative idea and moving away from that the fre frequency is diminishing. So, if there was no movement of people then there would be discontinuity in this graph and we do not find that discontinuity it is a continuous movement diminishing frequencies and so it is more consistent with the second hypothesis that agriculture the idea of agriculture moved with um, uh, people who took the technology of agriculture took it to another place taught the people there they started uh, doing the agriculture and then that is how they moved on. So, genes moved along with people have I made myself clear. Uh, can I ask you questions later on because I just ok thanks. <laughs> well, sure. thank you very much I think it has been a very very stimulating evening for everybody and let us thank the speaker again. Thank you.